guys, my name is Josh. And I stand before you as the most privileged human being in the universe because I am the husband of my awesome, beautiful, loving wife, Shiloh. And guys, I'm grateful to just be able to preach the word of God to you guys this morning. And I'm grateful, of course, to my leader, my friend, my mentor, Dr. Andrew Smelly, and his lovely wife who have uh, allowed me to preach the word of God with you guys today. Of course, they are in Maputo, Mozambique. And you know what's so awesome is that in Africa, we have so many languages. Uh, we, of course, I'm a Yoruba, you know what I'm saying? I'm Nigerian right there, Yoruba, yeah. yeah, we out here. Uh, just in Nigeria alone, there's over uh, 273 languages. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, pretty, it's pretty intense, right? There's Swahili, there's English, there's French, right? And even here in the D.C. church, there's a lot of great languages going on right now. Uh, there's Spanish, there's English, there's French, there's, there's uh, Vietnamese. But I, I, I think the newest language that we're all super fired up about right now is actually sign language. And uh, we, of course, we know our dear sister Eba Hile just got baptized as well. And we're praying for more friends. And guys, of course, we came from the, from the uh, ICLS right there, the Campus Leadership Seminar. I want you guys to turn to the most encouraging book in the Bible, the book of Revelations. In Revelations 19, we see something amazing. Of course, those of us came from a conference where we saw thousands upon thousands worshiping God. But it's going to be nothing like the conference that's going to be in heaven. And here's what the Bible says here in Revelations 19. It says, after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For the true, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Well, who is he talking about in the context, of course, is the image of Babylon, which represents worldliness, which he calls the great prostitute. And the Bible says that one day worldliness itself will be defeated and all the saints will gather and they will celebrate. I know all of us know how to celebrate when our team wins a game. I'm a Baltimore Ravens fan. And uh, for those of you who do not know, the Baltimore Ravens are definitely going to win the Super Bowl next year. And for all you haters who disagree, just sit and watch, okay? But best believe when the Baltimore Ravens win the Super Bowl, by a total score of 70 to zero. You're gonna see me celebrate. There's gonna be a great roar in Baltimore, right? But let me ask you guys this real question. Are we more fired up for church than we are for a football game? Are we more fired up to celebrate Jesus and salvation than we are to celebrate things like sports? You see guys, what happens in verse six is incredible. He says, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing water and like a loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God almighty reigns. Let us be, rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come. The Bible is explaining that there's going to be such a great multitude that the chairs of the people will sound like rushing water. It will sound like an ocean. The singing will sound like thunder. I mean, guys, when we, sang, when we sang together today, didn't it sound awesome? Imagine millions upon millions. My question to you is very simple. Are you going to be part of that multitude? Are you going to get to see that celebration? My title for today's charge is quite simple, The Banquet in Heaven. Guys, I know the ICLS was awesome, but that, that conference in heaven is going to be lit. It's going to be awesome, as the young ones say. I'm going to see incredible things. I'm going to look over to the right. I'm going to see Mike Cisse hanging out with the angel Michael. Two powerful mics right there, all the mics. Mike Cisse, Mike Ajibola, Mike Schaefer, Mike Gaddy, all the mics. Go be hanging out with Mike Angel. He's going to be sharing war stories. Michael sharing about the demons he slayed and the brothers sharing about their Bible studies. Amen. I'm going to look over to the left. I'm going to see the wise brothers. Wise brothers like Safiso, like Olivier like Kenny Doze, like Ben, like Jose Otero. I'm just going to see the wise brothers in deep conversation with the ancients and the sages strumming their beards as they discuss great things. I'm going to see the sisters absolutely fired up. And, and, and sisters, can you guys just imagine having some great sister times there? 
with the heroines of the Bible. Where are you going, sis? I have sister time with Queen Esther right now. I'm going, I'm, I'm going on, a, on, a, on a sister date right now with Hannah and Deborah. It's going to be incredible. I mean, me and my, my, my brother, we used to joke that, you know, all that, all that food that was sacrificed in the Old Testament, it all elevated up into heaven because there's going to be a great barbecue. The food is going to be awesome. I'm going to be eating the heavenly ribs and the heavenly steak. But of course, most beautiful, for some reason, there's just going to be one spirit that just is a gorgeous, shining spirit with heavenly fashion. I know that there's no marriage in heaven, but I think that my eyes are just going to be magnetized in that direction. Like, God, that, Jesus, who is that spirit right there? Why, Joshua, that was Shiloh. I knew it. I knew it. She's so beautiful. It's going to be incredible. But my question to you guys, are you going to be there? You see, you're not going to be invited to the party if you don't take the party host seriously. Let's go to Luke 14. He's, he talks about, in Revelations, we hear about the wedding of this lamb, right? Of course, we know the lamb, of course, is Jesus Christ, and he wants to invite us out. But th look at how Jesus prepares his party here in Luke 14, verse 15 to 24. I think we don't think enough about heaven. We need to have some FOMO for heaven. It's the fear of missing out. Because it's going to be lit in the other party, but in the wrong way. In Luke 14, verse 15 to 24, it says, When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied <laughs> with a parable, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just brought a, a, bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another, I just got married, so I can't come. Here you have this incredible party. He invites many people, and what do they start doing? They start making excuses. But let's be honest, their excuses don't really sound that bad. I was like, wait a second, hold on. This guy just bought a field. He's just trying to be a responsible man. He should go and take care of his field. This guy just got some oxen. I don't know who here has ever had any oxen. Anybody that's ever had oxen in the crowd? Uh, oxtail, no. It, my Jamaican brothers and sisters, oxtail is not what I'm talking about. We're talking about oxen, right? Okay. All right. A sheep, goat, all that type of stuff. Amen, amen. But if I got a bunch of oxen and sheep and goat, I got to go and take care of it, right? And then if I, you know, when I, when I got married to Shiloh, I was like, hey, yo, look, yeah, yo, I, I, got, I got to go be with my wife. You know what I'm saying? These sound like very intelligent excuses. So why does Jesus rebuke them? Well, these excuses are very specific. Jesus was so masterful in the way he formed his parables, and everything was very intentional. What is he referring to with these three, three examples? He's actually referring to the three first things that man were given to take care of back in the book of Genesis. What is man given? A field to take care of, the Garden of Eden. He then is given dominion over all the creatures, which represent the oxen in this parable. And what's the last gift given to him? Eve which represents marriage. These were actually gifts from God. But what was the problem? These gifts now became a distraction. These gifts became an idol. The very things that God had given man to help his life had now become the purpose of his life. They were focused on the provision and they forgot about the provider. Do we do that in our lives today? Do we, do, can God really trust us with blessings? Guys, I know all of us out here, we're some prayer warriors when it comes to our blessings. God, please bless me with this. But my question is, if God were to bless you with that, does he know that you're also going to turn away from him because of that? Can God trust you with the blessings? Can you keep your focus on him? Because right here, we see that they clearly lost their invitation to the party because of excuses which sound like daily life. Of course, are these things sin? No, but they're idols. And you know, guys, um, for, for those who are our friends joining us, is have you really took some time to discover what are the idols in your life that are making you uh, uh, lose your attention of God? And for those who have been baptized, sold out disciples that have repented and baptized, with the Holy Spirit inside of you, you got to ask yourself this question, do you find yourself cheating on God with ex-idols? Sneaking off for a little bit of time with pleasure, 
Neglecting your quiet times to have some time with, you know, social media and stuff like that in the morning. Playing, playing games and stuff like that. Not really cherishing your times with God. Devoting all your time, your effort, and your planning to your career and the greed for love of money. Do you have a little midnight rendezvous with sin? A little bit of pornography and masturbation. A little bit of impure relationships. Are we beginning to cheat on God with ex-idols? I like this picture. This picture scared me. It should scare you too. I want to show you this. This is a picture of what I think can be going on inside our hearts right now. You notice the human heart is in the center of the table and the different demonic idols are around the table with their little planners and their little money or whatever, planning on who's going to control the heart next. Who's going to call the shots for this person? You look at the next picture, a little bit more friendly, but it's almost the same exact idea. Negotiations between different false idols. A tug of war going on inside the heart. But where is God in the picture? Maybe 9 a.m. greed takes charge and, and by noon selfish ambition takes over. 5 p.m. anger takes charge. 11 p.m. Uh, leisure clocks out and pleasure clocks in. But my question is, uh, my point number one is a very simple question. Point number one, do you fellowship with the God of the Bible or do you wine and dine with idols? Do you fellowship with the God of the Bible or do you wine and dine with idols? And the question really, is Jesus your daily Lord? So I'm going to teach you guys something about Hebrew writing. Everywhere in the Bible where it mentions Jesus Christ, it says Lord and Messiah, right? In Hebrew writing, they always made sure to put the most important thing first. Because the first thing was always the key that led even to the secondary things. So every time you read your Bible and you see this and this, just know the Hebrew writers are actually teaching you the first thing I mentioned is the most important thing. In the Bible, whenever you talk about Jesus, he says, Lord and Messiah. What does that mean? The Lord part is the most important. Because he cannot be your Messiah until he is your Lord. Everybody wants a Messiah. Everybody wants the Savior. I don't think a lot of us like the Lord. I know so because some of y'all, you know, when, when it comes to your bosses at work and, you know, when it comes to your teachers and it comes to some people of authority, you know, we don't always like those who have any type of lordship over us, right? But do we trust Jesus with the lordship of our life? Jesus is awesome. Look at here in verse 25, right? We're still in Luke 14. We're still in Luke 14. Verse 25, Jesus is so cool. So he's like, hey, guys, I want everybody to come out to this party. I want many people to come. And then what happens? A lot of people show up. In verse 25, large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This is so counterintuitive. Jesus just said, hey, I want a lot of people to come. And then guess what? A lot of people come. And then immediately he preaches the most controversial, fearful thing ever. He tells the Israelites, you got to love God more than your own family. Now imagine, guys, that you were part of that large crowd and you went to go see Jesus. You and your buddies, you're fired up. This is great. We're going to go see Jesus Christ. He's the talk of the town. We want to see what's going on. You get there and immediately you see this man up there preaching, hate your mama, your daddy, your cousin, your uncle, everybody. You see lightning striking in the background, all that type of stuff. How would you feel? But, but why? Why would Jesus start after inviting everybody, why would he give such a strong charge to the people? Because he understood that the first thing that's going to distract you from getting to him is idolatry. And even good things like the oxen, like the field, like the marriage, and now he takes it further, like family, can be an idol if you're not careful. The word hate in the Greek is meseo. It means by extension to love less, but I also think it means to hate your sin. We got to hate sin in ourselves and in others. You cannot be a great cup, you cannot be a great policeman if you love crime. You cannot be a great Christian if you love sin. And you cannot hate what you're not disgusted by. I bring this up, guys, while also telling it myself. Guys, you're, you're, you're looking at a man who doesn't deserve to preach to you. Growing up, guys, I was a porn addict. Terabytes of data of pornography, masturbation was my calling card throughout the entire week. Yet I was a pastor's son. My dad, was a, my dad was a Pentecostal preacher and my mom was a choir lady. I was in church four 
out of seven days of the week. I also picked up the bass guitar and I started playing as a church musician. I remember using that same bass guitar. I'd walk into the clubs and the, and the parties Saturday night. The party would start around like 9 p.m., 10 p.m. We'd be done 1 a.m. Sunday morning. I'd walk into church that same Sunday morning and I'd, pr- and I'd play for the church. And you see me leading in worship and all these type of things, just a duplicit life. And I remember I, I, I loved my sin too much to change. The life of, of pleasure, of, of wanting more, 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 more joy, more, more lust, more everything. I loved it so much, and I wasn't disgusted by it. And I remembered that God was even trying to save me through different things like history class. Like my history teacher of all person gave us a nugget, and that should have been a knock on my head from God. This guy was like, hey, he, he broke it down to us. He said, every single time you click on a pornography ad, you are contributing to the revenue of certain companies. And then he now broke it down for us and tied it all the way down to child trafficking. I don't know if any of you guys have seen the, the movie Sound of Freedom. That was a very powerful movie. I recommend it. It's, it's intense though, it's intense. You know, prepare your heart before you watch it, but it's, it's a good movie that talks about the evils of child trafficking. And he literally explained to us that every time you click, you contribute to that. Now all of us are disgusted by that. All of us are disgusted by child trafficking, child pornography, pedophilia, that's disgusting. But we're not that disgusted by pornography. We're not that disgusted by lust. We're not that disgusted by impure relationships. And here's why. You cannot hate what you do not discuss. You've got to learn and study what is your sin actually doing. Being in touch with my sin is what helped me to overcome. Once I studied the consequences of it, the, 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 the intricacies of it, then I began to understand, like, oh, snap, I should hate this thing. All of us hate murder. We know that, we don't bat an eyelash at that. But the question is those soft sins, the sins that you pet to sleep at night, the ones that you roll with that are okay, the ones that you just kind of do on a fling, are you dealing with those as well? You know in Lagos, I told you guys in Africa we have a lot of of languages. Y'all won't believe it, we even speak Spanish in Africa. Yes, there is a whole country that speaks Spanish. And it was actually in Lagos, Nigeria. Now, no, we don't speak a lot of Spanish in Lagos. No, that, that doesn't happen. But there is one Spanish phrase that we like to use when I was in Lagos, and I learned this while I was in Lagos. It's called la vida loca. <laughs> it means to live the crazy life. And la vida loca is a phrase we use in Nigeria to explain those who are lavish and having all the fun and all the blast of everything that's going on in life. But unfortunately, that is also seeped into Christian culture. Where it's like we want both God and we want la vida loca, right? I think we need la vida holy, right? We need la vida holy. And here's why. I have a question for you guys. Who invented fun? Okay. Who invented pleasure? Who invented sex? Oh snap! Wait a second. Who invented music? Okay. So what is the deal? What does Satan, say, you know, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago. What does Satan do? He takes what God has already created for the goodness of man. He now twists it until it becomes ugly in our heart. Yet these things actually belong to God. God as well wants you to live la vida holy. Life to the full. I once heard it said that sex is like fire. It's awesome in a fireplace. But everywhere else it causes destruction. Within the fireplace of marriage, it's incredible. Outside, we have seen the destruction that it has caused. Of course, we know that God invented music. And guys, we were fired up because we just started our DCICC musical practices yesterday. And I know there's some of y'all out there that have not exposed your talents. And I'm going to find all of y'all and I'm going to hunt you guys down. We're going to find y'all, right? But music is powerful. It was created by God to be enjoyed. But what has God done, what has Satan done rather? He has taken everything that was supposed to be enjoyable by God and he has now twisted it. And you know, of course, the whole La Vida Loca life was really brought to the maximum by the Romans and the Greeks of their time. And that was so much in their culture that they couldn't even make up false gods properly. I don't know if you guys have ever read Greek philosophy. Have you guys ever read it? It's crazy. Okay, it looks like what I dare say a lifetime movie. My beautiful wife loves watching Lifetime movies. And often I find myself held hostage (laughs) watching these movies. 
And you know, I, I gotta admit, you know, it always starts off with me laughing, like, look at the Lifetime actors, you know, they, they look, look, look at these guys. But then at some point in time, I, I like sometimes I try to do my own thing on the side, but at some point in time, I'm like, oh, snap, that, that's, this story. Yo, this story is interesting. What's going on here? And then you're, you're just seeing crazy things about the, the, the wife that, that killed the neighbor across the street because she thought she was sleeping with the husband. Then she goes on a killing spree and all this type of stuff. And then this one is cheating with that one. And, this, and I'm like, oh, snap. You know, by the end of the movie, you're like, oh, snap, are they going to catch her? She, she, she looks so innocent. They got to catch her. When I read Greek philosophy, it looked like a Lifetime movie. The Greek gods were doing the same exact thing. Cheating on one another, backstabbing. One guy was trying to eat their kids because they were afraid that the kid was going to rise up and destroy. When I read Greek philosophy, I was like, oh, snap. Human beings are so bad at calling the shots, we don't even know how to make good false gods. <laughs> Our false gods don't make sense. Our false gods are not unified. Because here's the deal, guys. The Bible says that we were made in his image. God has never, ever been made in our image. And I'm kind of poking fun at Greek philosophy, but I do believe we also have what I call polytheistic Christians. Who are now beginning to rewrite the image of Jesus and God in their own image instead of the image of the Bible. I want to show you a few pictures of these images. This right here is probably the most popular image of Jesus of our time. You see there the, 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 the nice Jesus with the rainbow behind him, of course, representing LGBTQ. And then you see many ways to heaven. Anybody can come through. But is that the case? Is that what we just read in the banquet? Were there not conditions? Did he not say give up everything? Okay. Guys, sadly, a lot of people have created Jesus in their image. I like what my mentor Andrew says. If you accept everything, you're no better than a city sewer. You cannot accept everything. And here's the funny thing, the hypocrisy. You don't accept everything. You have a household to protect. Do you let anybody into your house? When you're riding your car, do you let anybody into your car? You want to start a family, do you let anybody? into that family? So wait a second, we get to be exclusive, but God doesn't? God has to accept all things, all types of nonsense, but we can, no. We were made in that image. That protective heart to protect our house is from God. Let's look at the next image. This here is the dictator Jesus. Why do I share this Jesus? Because it's been awesome. Guys, you should share your faith more often, right? I'm at Howard University, and you know what, guys? I'll be honest. A lot of people look at Jesus this way. They don't understand the real Jesus of the Bible. They think that Jesus is like this harsh, mean dictator, this God in the sky that's just calling all the shots. He doesn't really care about you and that he's ready to just destroy anybody that doesn't listen to. It's a very dark, sadistic mindset of Jesus. You see him there on the tank, all war heavy. No. So what's happening? We're swinging pendulums. It's either Jesus is super accepting and super loving or he's super justice and super harsh instead of understanding, no, there's a balance. God is both a God of love and a God of justice. But I think the most popular Jesus is this next one in the Christian world. This right here, this is the Jesus that most Christians are really trying to be like. Somebody said the Jordans, I would call them the Air Jerusalem 33s. You see him there with his chain and his Lamborghini, trying to be fresh to death. And unfortunately, guys, this is how a lot of Christians live their life. How do you know? Because that's what they want. And for some reason, until you look like that, you're not blessed. For some reason, unless you look like that, God isn't working in your life. For some reason, until you look like that, God has left me behind and I'm not, really, I'm not really highly favored. It's because your image of God itself is jacked up. It's because you're basing God's image on yourself. You're not basing God's image on his word. What's the real Jesus look like? Guys, let's give it up for the real Jesus. The real Jesus was sacrificial. He went through pain and suffering for us. He's amongst the people. He, wat he, he, he fed them. He took care of them. He cared for them. That is true Christianity. A Christian's life looks a lot more like this than any of those other pictures we looked at. 
amongst the people, I always ask this question of false pastors. Why do people need to come out to your church to get miracles? If I recall in the Bible, the apostles were going out to the people. Why do they need to come to a pulpit to be saved here by, with the altar call? If I recall, the disciples were going out into the streets and taking care of the people to preach to them. If I recall, Jesus fed the 5,000. You cannot be a Christian if you don't care about people. You cannot be a Christian if you're not willing to sacrifice and suffer a little bit. At what point did we not, what point did we get entitled to a life without pain? At what point did we get entitled to a life without suffering? You see, guys, there is a war against the identity of Jesus and God's character. My question is, what side of the war are you on? Can I, can I do a little teaching real quick? Verse 31, we're still in Luke 14. Verse 31. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. When he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. The biggest mistake in Christianity is that we are trying to set the terms of peace, but the terms of peace come from Jesus. Can I show you guys a few of these terms real quick? Acts 2 verse 36 to 38. Acts 2 verse 36 to 38. We see here a term of peace. In Acts 2, the Jews here are, are convicted about their sin. And in verse 36, it says, Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Oh, there it is again. Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Right here, they come to him. They say, hey, the Lord and Messiah has spoken. What do we need to do? He says what? You got to repent and be baptized. I've been going to church for my entire life. I've been going to church for 18 years, ever since I was a little baby. And for some reason, it wasn't until I sat down and studied the Bible, I actually saw this passage. And guys, if you do your Bible study, I'm not going to go too deep into it for the sake of time, but if you do your Bible study from this point on, every single Christian in the New Testament does two things. They repent and they get baptized, every single one of them. And he says the promise is for not only them that they were talking to, for all who are far off. That means you and I. But you're like, oh, dude, what? we saw Jesus save a bunch of people on earth. Well, I'm not going to get too deep into it. Like I said, if, if you're a friend and you're joining with us today, do, do some Bible study, right? I'm just going to breeze through this, right? In, in, in Matthew 9, it says that Jesus has the authority on earth to forgive sins. What does that mean? Jesus can forgive whoever he wants to forgive while he was on earth. It's awesome, right? So then who then made baptism a requirement? Well, Jesus himself. Just chapters later in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, he says what? Therefore, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples and what? Baptize them. From the moment Jesus says that, every single person had to repent and get baptized. By his own authority. But again, I ask you this question, is Jesus really your Lord? Or have you set your own terms of peace? Galatians 1. Galatians 1, I love the, the warning from the Apostle Paul. And, and, and the Galatian church, they started off great. But unfortunately, due to culture and the pressure from the society around them, they began to lose the image of God. They began to, uh, to mis, misunderstand the original teachings that they were taught. And so here's what Paul says in verse 1. I am totally fine with you guys. I don't want to offend you guys whatsoever. Is that what it says? The L.I.E. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say it again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I not trying to 
win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see, guys, we cannot be people pleasers. And let's be honest. Can we be honest? About 90% of what you really believe is because someone else told you about it. It's because you saw someone that you really respect and you love and they believed it, so you believed it too. Guess what? Paul had the same struggle. Look what he says in verse 13. For you have heard of my previous way in, of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for what? The traditions of my fathers. He wasn't zealous for God. He was zealous for what? The traditions of his fathers. He was reacting to what he had been taught since he was a young kid. And accepting the fact that there's this Jesus was hard for him. And so what? So much he persecuted the church. And I think that some of us, once we are shown the Bible, we start persecuting the Bible. We start persecuting the people that are trying to teach us. And guys, let me tell you what. Why, why was I a false preacher in the making, ready to just, you know, la vida loca and be a Christian at the same exact time? It's because I just wanted to make my dad proud. I, I come from like a, a lineage of all my uncles, everybody a pastor in my Nigerian family. Everybody's a pastor, everybody, everybody does some type of church thing. And I remember just wanting so much to make them proud. I remember so much wanting to just be the good boy on the outside, even though I didn't really have a lot going on in my heart that was righteous. And you gotta ask yourself, why do you do what you do? What influences you to do what you do? Here's my practical to all of you. Simplify your surrender. Simplify your surrender. Do not argue with the Bible. If it says ABC, guess what? ABC. Make it easy. Do you make it hard on God? Because, guys, here's the truth. I think some of us don't treat God like the party host. I think we, we treat him like the waiter. Sometimes we even treat him like the, the Starbucks barista right there. Yeah. I want my Christianity extra sweet, 2% struggle with whipped cream, sprinkle a spouse and some kids on there, and then, God, I will follow you. My first point, of course, was do you fellowship with God or do you wine and dine with the idols? My second point is very simple. Do you connect with the savior of your soul or do you sit alone in the spiritual hole? Do you really connect? Guys, let's be honest, sometimes it's hard to connect. Guys, I'm naturally an introvert, so my wife can attest to this. There are different types of people around a banquet table. You know like that one person that's kind of like awkward at the table? Like, he's not really talking that much. He's just kind of focused on his food right there yeah. or focus on the event. Okay, I am that guy at the table, okay? I confess this to you. My wife can attest to this, right? Like, I could, I could talk to y'all. I can hang out. We can we have a great time. But there's something about tables. I don't know what it is, whether it's like a wall in front of me or whatever. There's something about tables that psychologically just take me on my game. I don't understand. I need to study it out deeper. But you see, guys, sometimes it's hard for me to connect. And sometimes I think it's hard for us to connect to our Savior. But you see, we got to connect to Jesus Christ. He's got to remain our daily Messiah. We talked about the idols earlier, but I think that, guys, we can also have different Messiahs of our day. Let's be real. It's been a long, hard day. Your boss done said some stuff to you sideways. Somebody done cut you off. They were supposed to pay you on Friday, but for some reason the bank account didn't buzz. It's just a tough day. So what do you do? You come home, you take off your clothes, you put your bag down, and you bow down, and God, and you, you just pray to the God of Netflix. Netflix, deliver me from this tough day I've just had. I need a little bit of escapism right now. Reality is too hard. I've heard the young ones using these uh, three letters, I-R-L. I was like, what is that? Oh, in real life. Oh, okay, thank you. You guys just make up stuff for the sake of making up stuff. Just say in real life. It's the, it's, it's the same amount of syllables, and you say it IRL. It's actually harder. Anyways, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I digress. I digress. But in real life is hard. I need a little bit of Netflix. Maybe it's not Netflix. Maybe you bow down to the good old social media. 
the good old death scroll of, of, of shorts. You know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, YouTube short becomes YouTube long. You spent a good three hours work watching a bunch of 30 second videos. Or, 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 or maybe, maybe it's one of those days and you just open the fridge and you're like, praise be the ice cream. Praise be this ice cream that delivers me now from my depression. Maybe it's a romantic relationship. What is your daily Messiah? What do you really connect with? Who's really saving your soul? I love Paul. Paul is like one of the realest that's ever been. In Romans 7, Paul breaks down and he looks just like us when he says this. So why we read the Bible, guys, they actually relate to us. They weren't superhumans. In Romans 7, verse 15, it says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Paul sounds a lot like us, conflicted. He must have said, I do and do not do like a thousand times. It's even just confusing to read it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. But you see here, there's a confliction going on in the heart. And so what does Paul say in verse 21? So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another work at, law, uh, a law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through who? Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul is like, guys, the answer to all our afflictions is Jesus Christ. The, I, the answer to all the conflict, the internal war that's waging constantly in our hearts and our minds is Jesus Christ. But you see, you came to church. So in your mind, you're like, I already knew that. But do you live that? Do you really make Jesus the daily Messiah that you connect with? How are your quiet times in the morning? You know, guys, when you have a great time with God, you're like ready to conquer the world. When you know you connect, you're ready to go. I know I connect when either my, my prayers are getting to like near my, my eyes are about to cry or when I read the Bible and I'm convicted to change, now I'm ready to take on the world. But if you have like a fast food quiet time, like a bootleg quiet time where you don't really spend God with God, time with God. You just kind of did it, you know, just so that if somebody asks you, you can say that, hey, I read my Bible and I prayed. My quiet time back when I was in college was to read the Bible gateway uh, word of, verse of the day that just comes out, that one verse, and then just pray for like maybe five minutes and then I'm good to go. Yeah, it didn't work, right? We have to connect with God. Why? Because there's a confliction. And I love this quote. My brother, please put up the next quote here. We have heard this story many times, and I love it. An old Cherokee told his grandson, my son, there is a battle between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, jealousy, greed, resentment, inferiority, lies, and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope, humility, kindness, empathy, and truth. The boy thought about it and asked, grandfather, which wolf wins? The old man quietly replied, the one you feed. It is the one that we feed that will win. And you've got to ask yourself this question, have I fed my sinful nature more than the spirit of God? Do I really have times with God? In Romans 8, Paul brings further the answer to this dilemma. He says in verse 5, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live according to the spirit have their, their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. 
The mind governed by flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Here he says that our mind has to be governed. Notice it didn't say mind controlled, mind governed. God is not a, 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 a dictator God that's just going to zap the synapses of your mind to make you holy. I know a lot of people are waiting for that to happen. That's never going to happen. Your mind must be governed. It must be guided. The actual word there in the Greek, phronema, means to have a mindset towards the soul. It means to make the soul, make spiritual things the compass of everything that you do. Genghis Khan once said, conquering oneself is a greater task than conquering others. If I want to knock out Mike Tyson, I'm not going to ask Mike Tyson. I'm going to ask Buster Douglas because he did it. If I want to knock out the demons in my life, I'm not going to ask Satan how to do it. I'm not going to rely on his tools. I'm going to rely on Jesus Christ. I told you guys about my addiction. But you see, guys, in verse 36, what does he say? We can start in verse 35 of the same Romans 8. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or, or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, nor the demons nor the angel or anything can separate us from the love of Christ. My tablet just died. It's all good. My soul is still alive. And thankfully, I have this awesome Android to depend on. It is, it is, it is the Android. I don't know if the iPhone could have came in the clutch for me right there, but the, the Android just did. You see, guys, the Bible commands us to be more than conquerors. It commands us to be dominant. You know, I'm sick and tired of Christians walking around like you're the underdog. According to my Bible, God wins the war. According to my Bible, God is all powerful. According to my Bible, it is all the nations that will submit to God in the end. Last time I checked, we're on the winning side. Last time I checked, we're on the winning side. So stop acting like an underdog. Stop being so afraid of tackling the world. Stop being afraid of tackling your sin. Stop being afraid of going there. You see, guys, you don't have a boldness problem. You have a Jesus problem. You're not connected enough to Jesus. I'm an introvert. I have no business speaking to you. But I don't care that I'm an introvert. I have God's word to share. Did I get bullied when I was a kid? Absolutely. Guess what? I forgave my bullies because that's what God says. I'm not going to hold them in and stay bitter and get angry and then become a grumpy old guy. No, I'm not going to do this. Were there hurts that happened? Absolutely. But guess what? The Bible calls me to be more than a conqueror. And he's calling you to do the same. You see, the word conquer in the Greek is amazing. Right here on my Android. Right here on my Android, it is revealed to me that the word for more than conquerors is hypernakal. It means to be overwhelmingly victorious. Overwhelmingly, it was a rout. You know who loves an underdog story? Satan, because he's the underdog. You know who are the champions? The Christians. The Bible says to be overwhelmingly victorious, like when the Baltimore Ravens will win 70-0 in the Super Bowl. It will be overwhelming. The reason you still feel like an underdog to the world and even to your own sins is because you just haven't connected to the champion, Jesus Christ. And the closer you are to him, the more you'll see like, oh, snap, I'm about to win this thing. You guys ever overcame a sin? And how did you feel after that? She's like, wait a second, I did that? I overcame this? The joy. You guys ever overcame a habit? 
something that was just ruling, ruling your life? How did you feel after? That's awesome. That's how we should feel every single day. I close here in Revelations. Back to the most encouraging book. In Revelations 2, Jesus sets the example for us in how he disciples us and how we can overcome. In verse 1 of Revelations 2, it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstands from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is what? Victorious. It's the same as that Greek word that was used in more than a conqueror. To the one who is hyper in a cow, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Jesus sets the example on how to save our souls out of that spiritual hole. First of all, he addresses what we do well, and he appreciates the character. But then he directly rebukes the sinfulness, and he says what? I may remove what? Your lampstand. This is a salvation matter. He reminds us of the gravity. But then he encourages them to change. And then the last part was huge. He reminds them of God's promises. And what was so awesome, guys, when I studied this out, is that God gave specific promises to each of the seven churches, which, of course, represent the full totalness of God's people. And these gifts were very specific. First of all, he says the victor's crown, which will be given, of course, to the church in um, to the church in Ephesus. Of course, to the church in Smyrna, he says, I will give you a hidden manna with a new white stone with your new name on it. To another one, he says, I will give the morning star. To another one, he says, I will dress you in white. To another one, he says, I will not remove you from the book of life. To another one, he says, I will make you a, temper, a, temple, a pillar in the temple of my God. And to another one, he says, I will give the right to sit at the throne. And what's awesome is when you combine the imagery of all these different things that Jesus was talking about, what is he really saying? My brother, show the last picture. Not that one. <laughs> this one. What is Jesus doing? He's setting the table for us in heaven. Wow. He's setting the table for the banquet that's going to take place in heaven if we are victorious. Wow. Show the next image. I like this one. And it makes it more clear. And my friends and, and family today, I pray that we are going to make it to that party. I pray that at the, the gates of this party, the guest list is going to come out, which is called the Book of Life. I pray your name is on that list. And if it is on that list, you're going to get a nice white robe. You're going to be escorted to your table. And you're going to know where your name is because your name is going to be on one of those pillars. But then as you sit down, you're going to notice a white stone with a new name on it. And then there's going to be the hidden manna right there as the appetizer before the real banquet begins. And then Jesus is going to sit you down. He's going to put that golden crown on your head, the victor's crown. He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. There is a seat waiting for each and every one of us in that great banquet. My charge to you, get there. Take the party host seriously. He is our Lord. He is our Messiah. And to God be the glory.